I'm JD, the Media Jack, and this is the Media Jack Podcast, episode six, with a couple of guests, both of them have incredible and inspiring stories to tell. Two people who started off in one place in their lives, one place in this world, and are now thriving in a completely different life and a completely different story to tell in one that they never thought they would get to. I'm not going to spoil anything for you. I will let them tell their stories, including Lexi, who's coming up in a little bit, who has this amazing and inspiring health story to tell. But first, I want to remind you and thank everyone who is a part of the Patreon and supporting me here. If you'd like to be a part of Patreon and have a shout out, just like our executive producer, Red Wolf Don, then search for The Media Jack on Patreon. It just costs a couple of dollars a month. It sounds like one of those Sarah McLaughlin late night PSAs, but it literally only costs a couple of dollars a month to support me and everything I do. You can be a part of the Q&A as well as get a shout out if you want to be an executive producer. Again, thank you to everyone there. Secondly, if you don't want to go on to Patreon, then go to themediajack.ca. I have merch, believe it or not. I have Media Jack merch as well as Venting is Normal merch and Iron Bikini merch, a brand new line from bodybuilder Alicia Simpson. Again, the mediajack.ca is where you want to go. Now, on to the first guest of this episode. This is singer songwriter Sandy Joy on the Media Jack podcast. So, when it comes to my music, uh, the original songwriting that I do shows kind of the evolution of my own genre and it's hard to put myself in a box it started out as a country americana kind of thing and then as i kind of evolved as a songwriter it became much more um like my own signature sound and sometimes it can cross over into a little bit more of a country like a alternative country sound and sometimes it can cross over almost into like a cinematic soundtrack slash more pop kind of sound. So Mm -hmm. I'm obviously still exploring every avenue that I'm inspired by. Um, I grew up incredibly varied in musical styles. Uh, My mother and father are both musicians and they both just infiltrated me with everything from the blues, 80s rock, country to bluegrass to gospel i mean i'm all over the map so that all seems to be coming out every time i write a song in some way shape or form yeah as you as you mentioned you were exposed to the music industry and the music lifestyle as a young child your parents were very heavily uh involved with the music industry yes and they still are you know they're they're around 75 years old now, and they're still trucking musically. Um, my father is an incredible guitar player. He was a touring uh, musician back in the 70s with a band called Pig Iron that was signed to Clive Davis's record label. Um, my mother was she grew up as a piano player and a singer, and then she went on to focus on dance and became a rockette in Manhattan. And um, they just, together, they just play, and they harmonize beautifully. It's just like a symbolic representation of their marriage. So it's a really cool way to be raised. <laughs> at, at what age do you, can you recall uh, knowing that this is the life I want to lead? Honestly, you would think it would be like really young, hmm. but I didn't really decide or realize that I had something to offer until I was probably about my mid twenties. Really? Up until then I was passionate about music, but didn't really realize that I had something to offer. So it's, you know, it's only been about two decades of exploration for me. So we're, we're talking like a young child, preteen, teenager into your early adult years, knowing that you had a passion for it, but nothing really to offer. So what did you do in your time being? Well, I was in the military. After I graduated high school, I went right to basic training. Right. Um, and I got really consumed by that. Obviously, it's just what happens when you join the military. And, um, you know, I always knew there was this creative element in me that I never really knew how to express. So when I was in the military, I learned that there was a public affairs position that incorporates journalism and combat photography, just all of these elements that I knew that I had strengths in. So I just decided to dive into it. And I found a creative outlet in the Coast Guard. And it really helped me become a better writer, better communicator, I say, as I stumble trying to find that word. (laughs) (laughs) 
but um you know and i it helped me mature in being able to express myself so while i was stationed in miami um a friend of mine decided hey i know you can sing you want to join this cover band with me and it was actually like this it was we basically sang the karaoke tracks and uh you know we had a piano player kind of filling in the gaps and we just did gigs that way and that was my first step into the realm of music what was the cover band name that one was Tropical Obsession. I love it. <laughs> of course, in Miami. Um, but then, we, you know, I, I went with her up into the next level, which was a band called Carousel, and it was actually a MIDI band. Oh. Uh, back This was back in the early 2000s, so MIDI was like a new kind of format. Right. And it was, it was interesting. <laughs> but, like, to go from the military to Coast Guard, which a lot of people might not realize, like, there is that media... Uh, source within the military and combat photography I mean it it sounds intimidating as it is like you were going along the route of being creative while having that military structure throughout your career and how long did you do this for that was six years to tell you the truth I never picked up a camera in my life up until that and I went to the journalism school it's like a it's a three month long intensive military style journalism course that crams basically a two year college level journalism course into three months mm-hmm. with lots of punishment involved <laughs> and intense training. And, you know, every single night I had to write like an eight page paper about the most mundane thing. And, you know, it was just, it was grueling. But right. on top of it, you had to be learning how to use these expensive cameras and learn about what f-stops were and shutter speeds and go out and about and just shoot stuff and i had no idea what i was doing you could have stuck a book in front of me and made me read it for the next 35 years and i still wouldn't get it (laughs) but i would go out i would go out and i would take these pictures that the the instructor was like i can't grade you on your test work i have to grade you on your photos which are incredible so it was more of like again it was another way that i learned i'm not i'm not the typical creative type like i can't you can't just make me read stuff and then deliver like i have to explore i have to screw up i have to find my own way and i have to master whatever it is in the most unconventional way possible it's the best way to learn it's yeah it is uh you know dare i use the phrase trial by fire you learn from your mistakes and you experience everything firsthand. You get tussled around, uh, but you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, and then you learn from that experience. Yeah, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. <laughs> 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 My whole story. So uh, six years in the Coast Guard, and you clearly made a transition. You're, you you said uh, before, uh, before we started that you're a stay-at-home mom. Uh, you have a couple of kids. You have a husband. So that's a bit of a, a step away from the military life. Uh, what was the, the point that got you to where you are now? When I was in the Coast Guard, I reached a fork in the road where I either had to re-enlist or step away. And I loved being in the Coast Guard. It mm. was like the best experience of my young adult life. Right. Um, but I was really starting that was I was finding myself musically and having opportunities. And I was also doing these gigs while I had the duty phone on my hip. And in between set breaks, I'm trying to handle like high profile cases and interviews with Fox News or CNN or mm-hmm. you name it. And I realized something's got to something's got to happen. Either I need to step away and focus on music or I step away from the music and focus on the Coast Guard. So the choice was obvious. It wasn't easy, but it was obvious. Right. So I ended my enlistment and became a civilian and bumped and plowed my way through the mess of that transition. I was serving tables at every restaurant in New Jersey. As, <laughs> um, as any yeah. musician would experience at some point yes, in time. <laughs> totally. Um, you know, I also had gotten recently divorced. I married young while I was in the Coast Guard and we realized, no, this isn't going to work. So just divorced serving tables joining cover bands expanding my my vocal abilities and just stumbling around i think i moved like 12 times in those years and then i met my husband and everything just settled into place so 
that's um he's an audio engineer probably the best oh. one I've ever, ever the best one i've ever worked with and that's really how we met um, and, and you're not being biased at all because you're married to the man no no i'm, I'm <laughs> You know, as a singer, I'm kind of a snob when it comes to audio engineers because I need, you know, they need to know how to present me in such a way. Mm. And he was the first one that I had worked with that just he just knew what to do with my voice. And he's just a masterful engineer. And we so we met and four months later, he proposed. <laughs> wow, really? Yeah, we've been happily, happily married ever since for 10 years now with two little ones. That is beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah awesome. it, was meant to, it was meant to be. Clearly, very clearly. <laughs> yes. So now you have this uh, incredible family and you have an A-level audio engineer, as you stated in your notes, which yes. I'm not going to argue. I've heard <laughs> your stuff on Spotify. It sounds incredible. Thank you. So you started to take these steps now like was it daunting were you did you know what you were after did you again just kind of bump and stumble your way through and it was a bump and stumble but i was surrounded by just really wonderful friends and musicians that i've been working for working with for years and i learned so much from them you know a lot of them were kind of like mentors to me in the process and um you know all of those experiences were maturing me and understanding, you know, I can actually write. And a couple of years ago, I would have argued with you till my face turned blue that I am not a songwriter. No, there is no chance in the world that I could actually write a song. And if I did, it's going to be terrible. But as I started tinkering, tinkering around the piano and putting chords together, I felt all of those influences that I grew up with, mm. just kind of coming out in my own way. Um, and then lyrics just started flowing and now I'm three songs deep into who I am that I've, you know, songs that I've released and every single song feels like I'm going up a ladder of quality that I'm not ashamed to say. <laughs> so what was it that was, if you don't mind me asking, like, what was it that was holding you back? You, you, you were arguing till you're blue in the face, as you said, that, you know, you just don't have the the skills or the ability to do it, but like you, you pushed past it. What was holding you back? Self-doubt yeah. and the way that I perceived people who were doing that, I always, they were like elevated light years above me. And I, I kind of just, you know, in my own insecurities decided like, there's no chance that I could do anything like that. That's reserved for the people who are brilliant, who are, you know, have been doing this for decades, who just, vomit songs out on the turn of a dime you know and i just i had just basically settled in the idea that i am not that person and then you know through the people that i met that pushed me and pushed me and they were like you have something to offer just live in that right and and then on top of it i'm i was aging too so i was getting out of that caring so much about what people think about me and really just wanting to live in my art. Right. So it all was a, a developmental process. Yeah. So to backtrack, you, you started a childhood, incredible parents in the music industry, stepped away, tried to carve your own path in the military and the Coast Guard, which, I mean, must have been fun and incredible in many different wonderful and disappointing ways. And then yeah. stepping back into the music industry, like, was it kind of like putting on an old pair of shoes? Because this is something you grew up with. Yes. You know, unfortunately, I wasn't born until 1982. And my Unfortunately. Parents, I, <laughs> in, in the sense that, you know, my, my parents, like the prime of their original music career was in the 70s. Ah. So it wasn't until actually very recently that I've been able to explore the music that my father um, did in that band called Pig Iron and really appreciate the piano player that my mom is, you know, just because I'm so aware now, mm -hmm. now that I'm in it myself. And I also attribute my every ounce of my musical journey to what they exposed me to as a young kid you know we'd be driving through town and my mom would be listening to little river band and she would take a harmony part and i would too and you know i didn't even know i was doing something cool it was just what i knew it was what we did right 
and we would break into like four part harmony at the kitchen table or what you know, really you should, hear, you should hear when we sing happy birthday at a family party it's like i don't yeah, so, i don't doubt it at all it's it must sound incredible yeah it's really cool it's like a modern day partridge family kind of thing my brother's an incredible guitar player and my sister's an amazing vocalist she's actually the lead singer in my parents band right now so oh cool <laughs> yeah so it's it's everywhere i turn there's you know, influence and musical energy happening. You you guys really are the real life Partridge family. This is fun. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Um, I can hear uh, thumping around in the background there. I, I'm assuming it's your kids. It is. I had to bribe them with McDonald's um, <laughs> so that they didn't interrupt me. But yeah, I have a six year old and a nine year old, uh, Jeremy and Addie, and they are just mm. they are my world. They're do why I do what I do. Do do you do you see or sense any sort of uh, growing musical talent when you look at them? Yes. So my daughter, especially now that she's nine, mm. I can hear her quality of her voice developing. She's got like this little vibrato. It's amazing. And my son, Jeremy, actually, he has this gift of rhythm. Mm -hmm. So I kind of anticipating him exploring the, the percussion route, especially because he likes to smash things. <laughs> <laughs> but he can do it in tempo so oh um yeah and my my daughter Addie is also completely passionate about dance and we haven't given her any formal dance lessons yet but she's got it in her mm -hmm. so she must have gotten that from my mother uh, <laughs> if you don't mind me uh bringing this up you brought it up in the notes um there's something else that you and your daughter share that is um can be a hindrance but you see it as a unlocking of inspiration yeah. So recently I was diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy, which is a seizure disorder that a lot of people don't know about, but is unfortunately a very common disorder of yeah. epilepsy. And what it does is it, I don't have like a convulsive type seizure, but um, I tend to lose awareness and it's a whole experience that involves deja vu and just a really wild ride every time I have a seizure. And while it is causing brain damage when I have one, it seems to be gifting me in the realm of creativity at the same time. So it's kind of a give and take. Um, but my daughter was also recently diagnosed with the same thing. So there appears to be a genetic gene involved somewhere. But being that we caught it early with her, she's going to be just fine. However, I had it for eight years before I was officially diagnosed. So there's all kinds of brain damage. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm okay with it because in return, I'm able to write some really cool music and I create art too. Um, so I just live in this kind of sub planet of constant art and design and music. And if that's the price I have to pay for having epilepsy, then I'll pay it happily. You know, so, some people can take something like this, uh, something they're born with or had developed over the years, and they can not only live with it, but they can adjust a tune and even work with it. And, you know, it's since you have uh, figured it out and you figured it out within your daughter, I mean, it, it gives you the opportunity to uh, cope, work with and um make it a part of your life instead of something that holds you back. So, I mean, this is all, this is all good news. Absolutely. And I also wanted to be very deliberate in how I responded to my own diagnosis, especially after learning that what, you know, she had the same thing because I knew she was basically going to parrot what she sees in me. So right. I could either, you know, really be, distressed over it which i was when i was first diagnosed or i can embrace it and find a way to make it a gift as opposed to a curse right and you know i believe that i have it almost feels like you know i kind of walk in this alternate reality that i almost wish other people could exist in because it's 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 pretty neat it's increased my empathy and my perception of the world and humans around us and my love and adoration for people in all walks of life you know especially the past year that i've been diagnosed i just it's changed me for the better yeah so that's awesome that's beautiful to hear quite frankly thanks so spotify you have a couple of releases 
and uh, you have one on the way. I just released right. one in April, and I have several on the way. It's just oh. a matter of time and finances to bring them to life. But right. they're, you know, it's, they're going to be rolled out within probably the next year or so. so what has been uh, your feeling and what has been the reaction of your uh, recent releases onto the, any platform that puts yourself out into the world? So the first song, Sorry Ain't Enough, was a collaboration I did with a friend of mine, John Torgumson, and it was in the height of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't even get together and officially write like we normally would have. So that was actually done all in one take remotely, and we tr actually tracked it as a video and released it as a video. So the audio you're hearing on that song was just live one take video audio. And that was received really well, especially because it was such a specific um, genre of, you know, it's pretty honky tonk country kind of sound. Right. That was received really well. And I was like, you know, where do I go with the next song? So I wrote Fire on the Hills. And that still has a little bit of an essence of country to it, but it was it's um, I was venturing much more into the melodic realm, and that was also really well received. And that's thanks to the partnership of everybody that I worked with on that song that just, you know, I had the melody and the chords, and I gave it to my two brothers from another mother that I work with, John Tadrick and John Mansfield, and they just together came up with these just beautiful guitar lines that took the song in a place that I didn't even anticipate. And the song was produced by Jack Petroselli. We released it out to the world and it landed me a couple of different radio spots. And um, I started picking up some podcast interviews. And, here, uh, here we are. <laughs> yes, here we are. Um, but it did get FM radio play. Uh, mm. And you know, I was able to start performing it out live and stuff, which was exciting mm. because you know, the first time I was bringing a mu original music out. And then Wade and Gold, actually, my neighbor down the street, this is kind of a crazy story, but my neighbor down the street came to me and she said, hey, I'm the associate producer of this documentary um, called Authentic Conversations, Deep Talk with the Masters. And this is what it's about. It's basically how people who rise out of their struggles to impact humanity in just powerful ways. Right. And that's the essence of the entire project. And she said, do you think you could write our title track for it? And I was like, uh, wow. I'm just gonna have to say yes, because I can't say no and then regret it. So I, I said yes. And I was like, how much time do I have? And she was like, I don't know, a couple of weeks, a month. And I was like, <laughs> what have I done? Cause like fire on the hills, I think it took a full year just for the production of that and to complete writing mm -hmm. for it. And I was like, how on earth am I going to pull this off? Sure enough, I pulled, you know, my team of amazing musicians, John Tadrick, John Mansfield, once again, Jack Petroselli producing, and I got Miles Vandiver and Zebediah Briskovich on our rhythm section, who happened to be from my favorite artists in the world, uh, his band, Peter Mayer. Yeah. So, and Olivier Manchon on strings. And the song came together in a record matter of time. In, and I wrote the song in about two hours, actually, while I was driving. So it just it came to life in a month and released it. It's having a little trouble getting off the ground in the digital world, but I had a lot of people download it, you know, from iTunes, and friends, and you know, people on Bandcamp. Just you know, the pay the pay your own choice mm -hmm. option has been really a gift, and so it's definitely being loved and appreciated and as soon as it t hits with the release of the documentary i anticipate you know a little more traction with it so mm. with uh i i had i had to listen to your your tracks you just released and all of them like love them absolutely love them uh, i'll be the first to admit uh, when it comes to country music i grew up on country music i grew up on on western music uh today not too much of a fan, but I can still appreciate it. And like you have an incredible talent and clearly an incredible crew. I had no idea that that first track uh, was a one take over one take. over a video feed. That it sound it sounds stunning for what you were able to accomplish. That's amazing. Congratulations Thanks. on that. Yeah. Thanks. 
with the world opening up, though, uh, you've have you had a chance to actually go out and uh, meet more people and make those connections? Because, I mean, let's face it, we were all stagnant for almost two years. Yes, it definitely hurt the live performance realm, which hurt me directly because I was just starting to step out as an artist and I gained all this traction. I put on a an insane Christmas show that sold out mm. um, and I was really, the momentum was going and then boom, COVID hit and everything came to a screeching halt. Yeah. Um, so I tried to use that time, you know, this was also when I was diagnosed with the epilepsy. So as, as much as I could, I tried to stay in the writing mode and, you know, the songs you hear now on my Spotify are evidence of that. And now that things are starting to kind of open up again, I was able to land a national agent who also happens to be Peter Mayer's <laughs> manager. And hopefully, you know, given the next couple of months, I'll be able to start landing some really interesting gigs around the country. I, you know, just the other day, I was awarded the opportunity through, you know, John Tadrick and a friend of ours, Akil Thompson, who is the guitar player for Little Big Town. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were given the opportunity to go hang with them at their last show of the tour with Miranda Lambert and just kind of enjoy being in that environment. So yes, connections are being made and people are opening doors to me again. And hopefully I can start that momentum train going again, where people just latch on and support and become that driving force for me to do what I do. I have zero doubt in my mind that you uh, are going to be able to get back out, get up to speed and, uh, you know, get out in front of the stage and just, you know, be able to quickly and efficiently show the world what you're capable of. I mean, thank you. Thank you. It was tough because, um, you know, for the last couple of years, I was actually the lead singer of a cover band, country cover band, which, like you said, ironically, I, I'm not really into country. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. And I, I definitely appreciate artists that are kind of outside of the cookie cutter country sound. Yeah. Um, and but my voice happens to sit really well with country. So I got I got pretty into it. Yeah. Um, but not my first choice of music. But, you know, coming out of that, I kind of developed this persona. You know, everybody expected me to be a, the next country artist mm. and stuff. But it's it's not who I am. So I've also had to reestablish who I am as an as an artist yeah you know to, to to say country these days though and this is someone within the music industry you know as a broadcaster it it has come a long way i mean we are a long step away from the roots of uh randy travis uh patty loveless uh and the like uh the nitty-gritty dirt band which even still for their time they were bordering on on uh, more rock than country and so because of everything's everything that has changed over the years and people's tastes have become more diverse you can't really categorize someone as solely country as easily these days so being able to uh, branch out adventure into different uh, genres and explore while maintaining core roots in certain genres is not that strange anymore no, it's it's not. And I, I'm actually almost proud of it because, you know, as you listen through my tracks, you can kind of hear the evolution of me finding myself. And I, I kind of wear that proudly. And, you know, again, with the country thing, there's so many subgenres. Yeah. You know, there's the country pop radio sound. And then again, there's like, you know, the more folksy Americana sound, which I enjoy dabbling in that mm -hmm. um, because that's more it's more melodic and it's more who I am. So if I'm under a country umbrella in that regard, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, but I'm also okay with kind of being in a soundtrack kind of genre or melodic pop or even ambient. Mm -hmm. I do some synthesizer stuff too that I've been dabbling in now too. So cool. who knows where that's going to go. <laughs> What's next for Sandy? So what's next for me yes. is I have about eight or nine songs on the back burner now that just need to be developed. And I'm going to start performing them out live long before I even get them in the recording studio. And, you know, there, there's a very there's an expense involved in recording and production. So I can't wait 
to kind of build up the finances and then deliver the song. So I'm just going to have to take them out on the road and trial by fire with those, with the, you know, just the bumpy ride that that may be. Right. And, you know, just take it from there. And they're, they're all songs that I'm really excited to bring to life. And, you know, it's, it's the road life that really defines an artist. There was a recent documentary uh, put out by Dave Grohl all about, you know, being on the road and what drives artists and, you know, that, that bump and stumble experience is what really creates stories and creates what can be a, a once in a lifetime experience for an artist. So like this sounds absolutely fun and incredible for you. Yeah, I'm I'm ready for whatever that takes and whatever it looks like, even the you know, the good, bad, the ugly. And, you know, it's just gonna add to my story and my legacy and my kids will be able to share my stories like I can about my parents. And that's really that's more important to me than record sales or, you know, views or listens on Spotify. You know, it's just I wanna I wanna walk in every aspect of it proudly. Where can people find you on social media and where can they find your work? So you can find me basically on Instagram, uh, Facebook at Sandy Joy Music and make sure it's S-A-N-D-I, Sandy with an I, mm. joy like joy to the world music. Um, you can also find me on Spotify under Sandy Joy. Everywhere there's digital music, you'll find me there. Just make sure you put the I in Sandy. Um, and you can listen to all of my tracks on Bandcamp if you are interested in downloading. That's probably the most supportive way to just really support an artist because a lot more of the money goes to the artist as opposed to the other streaming services. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time and congratulations. And I wish you the greatest of, of success. And at some point in time, I would not be surprised to see you show up in my neck of the woods and I would gladly shake your hand. Thank you so much. As a Rush fan, I'd be thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> If you would like to hear Sandy Joy's music and what she has posted, the links are in the description down below, either on YouTube or perhaps you're listening to this on an audio podcast, in which case the links will be in the description of this episode. But before we move on to our next guest, just another friendly reminder, if you'd like to check out some merch, I have the Media Jack merch as well as what I close with on my live streams, Venting is Normal, which is a slogan I like to use and is very true. Venting is always normal. Never apologize for it. As well, Iron Bikini, brand new merch, cool designs by bodybuilder Alicia Simpson. All of it is available on my website, themediajack.ca. You'll see the merch tab and check it out for yourself. Now, on to the next guest. This is Lexi. For the majority of the day and after the point of asking you if you could spend some time and talk to me. I didn't know how to how to open this thing up. Mm -hmm. All I knew is that I was a big fan of Supplement King. Mm -hmm. um, and my girlfriend and I went to the store when we were in Grand Prairie and then we heard that there was one opening up in Prince George. And I opened a door and it's just this beaming <laughs> energy. <laughs> just like oh. coming towards me exactly. <laughs> it's just 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 like so welcoming and just like asking questions and you know wanting to get to know what I, what i'm after and blah blah blah, mm. blah. it was all you <laughs> so hi lexi hi <laughs> hi jd yeah. um do you okay i'm not even sure about this but i just want to make sure that i am <laughs> absolutely on track with everything that's current event you still mm -hmm. work at supplement king i don't you do not i don't no okay and that's okay uh, i work at angel's aerial fitness currently oh congratulations thank you thank you angel is a is an icon in the industry she and in is. Prince George. oh she is yes. i love her she has given me like such a safe space over the last uh i've been polling i think for three years uh, almost three years in september yeah and it's yeah and she i never even thought that i would ever be staff like especially not events coordinator oh. <laughs> but here i am and i'm so I'm, I'm pretty proud of myself for for getting to that point you know from being student to eventually one day i will i will be a teacher it's not kind of a secret but not really <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't i don't doubt it i mean just how you carry yourself and how you go about Thank things you. is incredible okay so 
the reason why mm-hmm. uh, I wanted to have a conversation with you is because um, for me, it's been about 10 years mm-hmm. since I took it upon myself to rebuild myself wow. and, and go on this incredible uh, self-searching energy, mm-hmm. finding That's strength, amazing. building journey. And when I met you at Supplement King, uh, I just saw this, like I said, bundle of energy, fit young woman who is just informed and wanting to be helpful and whatever. And then I started following you on social media. And I realized that everyone's journey is different, but Mm -hmm. I bow down to you. You are incredible. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So let's, can we start off there where, Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a point in time and there was a point in my time Mm -hmm. um, that you saw yourself and went, shit's got to change. Where were you when it happened and what caused that change? This is probably my favorite question to answer (laughs) because it is because it's just so it was so powerful for me um real listening to myself and you know finally listening to myself at that point where i did i looked in the mirror i had gotten a sunburn i was i think i think like six six months postpartum after giving birth to my son Mm. and before this i had been even heavier but i refused to weigh myself because i knew that I had gained about 100 pounds during pregnancy and I didn't want to look at the scale. Like I told the doctor when I went in for my appointments, my midwife, I'm like, don't read it out to me. Like, I don't want to hear it. Just put it in the chart and be done with it. Um, And then I got to my mom's house and my mom was on Weight Watchers. And my mom's like, well, why don't you weigh yourself just to see? And um, I didn't. You know, I I told her, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm like 200 and something pounds, mom. Yeah, yeah, okay. And my mom's like, yeah, sure, okay. (laughs) And I looked at I, I looked at myself in the mirror at that point though, and I was like, man, like, I don't like the way I look. I'm really unhappy with the way I look. Mm. And despite being, you know, 300 pounds, I still had a nice hourglass. <laughs> but I was like, I don't, I just didn't, I was just wasn't, you know, and I wasn't healthy. I could feel my bones aching mm. with it, like uh, just about every step I took. Um, I was had no energy. I was just lethargic and. I had lost a lot of blood during pregnancy. I think I lost about, um, they said two pints, two and a half, about two pints. I needed a transfusion because wow. it was really quite traumatic. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, what, another one of the reasons why I have s- such, you know, issues even now with my health too is because the, the delivery was just so traumatic. So traumatic. Oh man. But um, we don't like to tell traumatic birth stories to scare people away from, you know, giving natural birth or anything like that. Uh, mm. But uh, so then uh, fast forward about a week, I was traveling a lot with my son because, you know, my postpartum depression was bad. I didn't really want to be alone. So I go to my mom's house, go to great grandparents house in, in Chase, go to, you know, my dad, my mom's in Terrace and stuff like that. And so I was in Chase and in the middle of Chase, in the middle of the desert, there's two giant waterfalls. Yeah. And you're like, why is there these giant? So they do zip lining over top of them. And I love I may not look like it, but I'm like a crazy adrenaline junkie. Like if I can jump off of something and be safe and live and not, you know, die after, then I'll right. do it. Um, so zip lining, I was like, yep, sign me up. Um, and I'd done it a lot before I had given birth to my son, but not, you know, post birth. So I went there and they have to know your weight for your harness, right? To be able to size you with a proper harness and they read my weight out in front of all of the really cute Australian boys that were working in that in that little uh, thing there. I think it's I can't remember what it's called, uh, but the zipline place. And they said 298 pounds. And I was like, no, no, I I, if you I wish I could have had like a picture of my, my face in that moment or like being able to see my reaction because I just went I went white as a sheet. Um, I was like, this is not okay. And my partner at the time had heard it as well. And he saw my face and he just, you know, he came over and he like, he's like, are you okay? Hmm. And I'm like, yeah, let's just, let's just go. And I had fun and I lost my earring cause I flipped upside down on the zip line on purpose, okay. uh, intentionally. <laughs> um, but it was just, yeah. And so on the drive home, um, I was by myself cause my partner had to fly out. He works for CN. So he just flew to wherever he was, Saskatchewan or something like that. And I was driving home by myself with my son and I, I physically spoke out loud to myself and I said, this is not okay. I said, I am worth more than this. And if I want to live past my family's very short life expectancy of like 80 years old, like I want to be able to be there for my son 
And being a young mom, I said, I should be of, of all people. I should be, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm young and I can, I have the ability to do this. And when I got home, I signed up for the YMCA and that was it. Really? <laughs> I, uh, I found a gym with childcare. Obviously that was really super important. Um, my partner worked for CN, so gone for long periods of time. I was by myself quite often. Um, and so having that childcare made all the difference. Uh, even now, I think you have to book appointments for it, but like what a convenience and $40 a year. So incredibly affordable for childcare for, child care for the whole year at the YMCA. So like it's un unbeatable for an hour and a half of you time. Um, so after I had joined the uh, YMCA, I started walking um, and then I walked around. I lived on Kearney Street at the time. So I'd walk up and down Kearney Street. And then one day my body said, run, start running. And I was like, what girl? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> No way <laughs> and i started running mm. and i ran a block the first time and i was so out of breath and had shin splints for like a week after but i was like why did i love that so much and so eventually that evolved into a real deep passion for running and my last run my last run i ever did i ever could do doctor said no more um was 5k and i pushed my son in his stroller i think i was made it in 35 minutes it was a clay late to name mother's day run this year oh yeah Wow. And uh, I was I was so I was so impressed with myself. I'm like, okay, that's a good one to tie the, hang up the shoes to. Beyond that, like I found I had my birth doula had actually uh said she found an, there was an old friend from Terrace, a mutual friend from Terrace, and she's like, "Well, she's doing this 9-week fitness challenge." And I said, uh, "Well, I have everything and nothing to lose, so you know, whatever, take my take my a couple hundred dollars whatever." Um and I ended up losing 75 pounds in that 9 weeks. And my doctor had, I'd been to my doctor, you know, he would clear me for exercise and stuff like that. That's super important. Oh my gosh, I can't stress that enough. Right. Seeing the doctor at, at that point, because when you're pregnant, your abs literally rip in half you need to make room for the baby, right? So you got to slowly work those back in. Mm. Um, and he also got me in with a therapist as well, just about right away to start talking about like my postpartum depression and actually something that's not talked about a lot, postpartum rage. Uh, so rage. The postpartum rage. It is a very real thing okay. where, you know, your child is crying and crying and crying and crying and you can't get away from it, especially being, you know, a mom by myself. I can't just leave my infant. Right. right. So you get angrier and angrier and angrier. And thank goodness I was able to deal with it in the proper way and through the proper outlets where, you know, nobody, nobody was harmed. <laughs> and um, just, you know, breaking that, breaking that cycle of abuse even in my from my from my family from the past generations uh, right. being able to recognize that and, and reach out for help was really big after that after that program that i did i kept on it i did another one right after that i lost another 25 pounds i did weight watchers for a little bit which was fantastic made me rethink the way i do food i was on that for about a year and with all that combined knowledge um, and actually following people on instagram which is fantastic that we have all these platforms alicia is one of the wonderful fitness people that i follow on instagram just love her mm. i was able to maintain and sustain that and i'm still you know inactive weight loss and i've had a lot of other great trainers like i had a really good life mentor tasha wall i don't know if you've heard of her she's been in prince george for quite a while but she was an amazing life mentor and she really made me dig deep and be like you know you're worth this you're worth being you know a fit young fit young woman and and being hot you know you're you're worth it everybody's worth it mm. and then i met chantelle from angels aerial fitness yeah and uh I walked into Reflex because I was going to buy my first supplements and uh, Chantel, I had noticed that she had Angel's cards there and I said, do you know anything about Angel's? And she said, do I know anything about Angel's? <laughs> she had been teaching there for like 10 years at this point mm -hmm. and uh, I, I said, I told her because I had started following Angel's when I came to Prince George right. um, and I said, once I lose 100 pounds, I'm going to sign up for pole. And I had lost about, I think I had lost about 195 at that point. And she's like, well, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting? Are you really waiting for five pounds? She says, and I'm like, okay, okay. So I signed up. <laughs> Best thing I ever did. Oh my God. And 
those women, all of those women in there, we are like, we're like a family. It's like sisterhood of the traveling poles. <laughs> uh, it, everyone is there for each other. Um, and it's just su such a great community to be a part of. And now I actually work there. So never three years ago did I think that, you know, me, Alexis, stumbling around on the pole would be working at working at Angels Aerial Fitness, you know, dancing in my in my eight inch pleasers. <laughs> um, and it, it just instilled so much confidence in me. And I really think that that wholeheartedly contributed to me being able to continue to do to do all of this to lose 160 pounds yeah. and to just be me and be this nice refined version of me <laughs> that's an incredible journey and congratulations like 160 pounds okay that's more than half of you yes yeah on yeah I know it's it's insane. I my I have a goal. I'd like to eventually deadlift my old weight, which is oh, it's a lot of weight. So we're gonna we're gonna work real slow on that, <laughs> really slow. <laughs> but that would be just to be able to see that weight in front of me because I've seen you know I have friends like I'm sure you know you go to Golds you know Justin that goes there and he's got a, he does the lifts and I'm looking at some of his lifts and some of his lifts are my my old weight and I'm looking at it and I'm like, wow like having realizing that all that was like on my bones and mm. on my frame and on my nervous system and i'm like no wonder it was so hard for me during pregnancy because i had a really rough time mm. and you know the weight definitely contributed to a lot of it because i had the mentality that a lot of people do and i was like oh well, i'm eating for two so i can eat all this junk and all this no no no, no. that is a no. giant myth yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know why people still say that. <laughs> it's an excuse. That's all it is. It's an excuse. You know, <laughs> just quickly touching on pole fitness. My God, does that work your core? Oh, it yes. Is insane. Oh, yeah. It is. It's everything. It's everything. It's all it's full body. And that's why I bought one for my house, too, because I'm just I'm crazy about it. Like yeah. it you work muscles that you don't even think that you had like and then Angel's actually gotten me um, gotten me into uh, body blueprint so i'm taking my fitness theory now so now that i know the names of the muscles now too i'm thinking twice as hard about what i'm doing and it is just so insane some of the things especially angel because she's been doing it for so long the things that she can do i'm just like wow <laughs> <laughs> the first time the first time i met her i was at a studio party mm -hmm. and she did uh she does a performance at the end of the studio party and i was sitting there wow wow <laughs> whoa wow like just just enthralled right and because she's just this 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 small woman we weigh the same weight now by the way which i'm just like wow yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which i'm like yay <laughs> Fine. um just to watch her do that and so fluidly and so smoothly i'm like i i I need to be able to do that. Like, I, <laughs> yeah, so fantastic. And the way she teaches too, uh, the fact that she is just so patient and so kind and so understanding, and you know, makes really makes a huge difference. Because when you have a teacher that's like, eh, that doesn't really want to be there, that's you know, not really as into it as you are. You yeah. know, you never get the best experience. But Angel is is all in, yeah. and it makes such a big difference. With your journey. Mm -hmm. Was there ever any time that you found it daunting or you stumbled? Or, oh, you know? man, all, all the time, like every day, every day, like because, you know, I had depression before I had postpartum. And so it's kind of a, it's a lifelong, lifelong battle. Right. Mm -hmm. And every day, especially when I was first starting, I, I would wake up and I'd be like, oh, I have to do this and this and this. And I would get I would get mad. Right. And I'd be like, ah, uh, like, and then, you know, who's the only other person there? My, my, my son. So, you know, I'd get short, you know, I'd be short with him and probably not as, not as, you know, nice as I, nice as I should have been to him. Um, and he is such a big motivation now, now that he's talking and he's walking and I'm really quite on the other side of the hill from that, from the PPD now, mm -hmm. I really feel like, and with, between, you know, exercise and nutrition and doing the things that I love in life and being 
authentic to myself. So, you know, of course I'd be like, oh, well now I've, now I've ruined the day by being mad at my son. So I would, I wouldn't go to the gym and I'd just go for a walk instead. But those walks that I would do ended up being something really fantastic because that's when I started running with my son. And he's ran with me basically since eight months old to last Mother's Day. And he says, go mommy, go, go mommy, go. And when I, when I hear that, I, I, I cry tears of fuck my hips hurt. <laughs> God damn, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know, my my little person is 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 cheering for me. Mm -hmm. You know, in spite of in spite of, you know, how mad I was and how sad I was. Mm -hmm. And he just looks at me every day with so much love. And I'm like, if this little tiny human can show this much love and only be on this earth for so long, why should I be on be on this earth for twenty seven year, years? <laughs> and uh be this miserable yeah and i really he just really gave me such as when i st really started getting um i have actually a best friend that's a therapist mm -hmm. and he's been my you know my go-to for the last for these kinds of things and he's helped me so much on top of the therapist that i see yeah. and what a great help and through that doing that actively and you know participating in it because you can do it and not participate in it because yeah, <laughs> yeah. i've done done that <laughs> yeah. um just motivates me to to keep going like and he's yeah my sunshine he's so sweet i think he might be we think he might be autistic okay. uh my brother is autistic and i for a while suspected myself and i was put through testing as a kid and there's been recent evidence to show that it can be genetic there's some cases where it can, is genetic mm. and uh so we're getting, getting him in for testing and so there's difficult days and those days especially you know mm are days that when I was still at home and he wasn't in daycare uh, were the days that it was really so hard to get myself to the to the gym. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those days where I, you know, being in my postpartum fog, yeah. uh, wasn't able, I wasn't able to recognize a lot of his needs and in that time. And now going back, looking back, I can see where, you know, where some of those mistakes were. And that just, you know, I just don't want to you know make those mistakes again because mm. life is now with covid and all this and war my god uh like life's too short life is way too short i i mean i was thinking this obvious before then but you know now especially these things right in front of us i didn't think this would happen in my lifetime honestly yeah I really didn't how strong is the connection in your opinion for your physical health and your mental health. Oh, it's like you can't have one without the other. And they tend to, sometimes they will coincide with each other. Sometimes they'll help each other out, but more often than not, they won't. And you really will have to get a battle of this, you know, in order to make the rest of you work. Because if you are in a chemical imbalance, there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. There's, you can even exercise, till the cows come home you can exercise till your till your bones break until you're bleeding but if you're not if you're not exercising the most important muscle of all which is your brain you can't do it like yeah. and and i really and i tried for a long time because i got i was like oh i don't need my therapist i'm okay i think this was about at 75 pounds i kind of went through this little ind independent phase where I was like, oh, I can do this on my own. I can do this on my own. And I, I quickly fell flat on my face and I stopped talking to my therapist and I stopped reaching out for help and stuff like that. And I didn't see my doctor for a couple period of a couple months because I very actively go and see him just because of my hip dysplasia um, and then my nerve pain that I have, which we suspect to be fibromyalgia mm. and my chronic fatigue uh, and and I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it without the help. Um, and I've been able, I've been on medication before, um, but I explicitly said that I didn't want to this time. I wanted to try my best to go without it. And right now I've found a really good balance of, um, you know, healthy living and also also cbd cbd helps yeah. <laughs> cbd helps a lot especially yeah. when it comes to the nerve pain and stuff like that but um you really can't have one without the other and i that's why i always tell people like when people ask me they're like how do you do it alexis like what did what did you do and i'm and 
I just can't. I wish I could give a short answer, but obviously I can't. <laughs> there, there's no such thing as a short there's answer. Not, not, not with that kind of thing. Yeah. And the first thing I, I tell people, I'm like, reach out to your doctor and see what your doctor says. Like, and if you don't have a good doctor, go find a good doctor. Yeah. You know, that's the beauty about living in Canada is that we have, you know, the, the freedom to choose the doctor that you like. Um, I was fortunate. I came to Prince George pregnant, so I was automatically with a doctor. And I'm very fortunate that way. And I understand that there's pro there's big, big waiting list, but there's apps and stuff like that that we can reach out on. You can Zoom call doctors now from just about all over the province. So we really can, we can pick to a certain point. Um, so I always tell people, I mean, check with your doctor first because there could be there could be some kind of physical underlying issue that you don't know about. Like for, with me, like I would never have ran if I knew I had hip dysplasia. If I knew I had a fractured hip, my God, I would have walked on cushions. <laughs> like. I would have I would have done everything I I knew to not you know ir irritate and agitate my hip and I ran for like almost a year and a half on my broken <laughs> hip and <laughs> your doctor afterwards like um <laughs> I well I had and it's not and that wasn't his fault because okay. I had I had I had pain in my hip and we thought it was my sciatica so we did all these tests and I did all this rolfing and chiropracting and massage therapy and all this kind of stuff. Mm. And then, you know, I, I actually fell on it when I was pregnant. We pinpointed it to when I actually broke it. Right. Um, but I was born with a hip dysplasia. I was actually actually born with a deformed hip socket. So my hip was like this sometimes and kind of falls out of its socket. If I would have known that, I never would have. But then we did an x-ray like last year, I think. Uh, and that actually physically showed because we never th we never thought no, you don't think to do an x-ray for hip pain most most people don't and uh finally my doctor was like you know what let's just do it and he did it and they found i had a fracture and hip dysplasia so it's so 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 important to go to the freaking doctor oh my goodness oh yeah oh 100%. and not only that but especially post baby a lot of women that are looking to start their journey post baby even second baby third baby your abs like rip in half physically mm, rip mm. in half to hold the baby. So if you go and try to do crunches on your torn in half abdominals, they're gonna go and it's gonna be very, very painful and you're going to hurt yourself very badly. And I, I would know, cause I did. And I went too hard and I went too hard, a little too hard, too fast. Mm. Um, and I ended up with a very, 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 very small, thank goodness, hernia in my abs. And uh, we were able to, we were able to deal with it and get it out of there, thank goodness. Yeah. Um, amongst other things, but, uh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, shit. I know, uh, right? <laughs> Literally. <sh> <laughs> One of my favorite stories to tell is, um, when I was on my journey. Mm -hmm. and yes, please tell me. Ten, <laughs> 10 years is a long time. 10 years was a long time. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah, you've never had a chance to talk about this. You, you watched one of my episodes where I just completely vented about my family and mm -hmm. therapeutic because it was, it didn't cover everything that was going on. So it was about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. 2000. It was actually December, 2011. It was just between Christmas and New Year's. I was married and um, just, just for the record, uh, my ex-wife and I, we get along famously now. Oh, good. We just, the marriage just wasn't working Same anymore. Same with me and my ex, yeah. yeah. Yep. So anyway, it was around that time I realized I needed to make some changes. Mm -hmm. And among other things was my health, um, physically, mm -hmm. mentally, and also just, I, I wasn't happy with myself. I wasn't happy yeah. with where I was. So I challenged myself to go 100 days straight of eating healthy, mm -hmm. sleeping ah. well, and hitting and getting some sort of exercise, yeah. not necessarily hitting the gym. And I documented it. I Oh, that's so important. I, I held myself accountable by... This is this is before Facebook is what it is now, mm -hmm. and it was way before TikTok and the days of Twitter, right? And Twitter, MySpace. Exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. I documented it on Twitter, and I kept myself accountable on Twitter. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't get a whole bunch of feedback, but that wasn't the point. Yeah. Right. The point was is that I was holding myself publicly publicly accountable. I wasn't mm -hmm. looking for support. I was just putting it out there. Um. It was during the first 20, I realized like I can start upping my game. I was embarrassed and kind of self-conscious about going to the gym. Oh, yes. Oh, I remember so, that feeling. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'd, I would like, I would go for walks and then I'd, I'd work out at home as best as possible. And I got myself a, a shitty $100 elliptical, but I burnt that thing out. <laughs> That's awesome. So I started to notice that I needed some dietary help. Mm -hmm. Now I, I make, I make 
Everyone makes mistakes. The biggest mistake I made was I went to a supplement store, not Reflex, way before Supplement, supplement King was here. Mm-hmm. I went to a supplement store and I said, I'm looking to work out. I'm looking to just kind of help myself as I'm at the gym. Mm-hmm. And the guy suggested, oh, take this. Uh. And didn't really know much about it. So, oh no. <laughs> I never got into trouble. I never I never like hurt myself or did anything wrong. Mm-hmm. But what I what I started doing is like, okay, well, I'll read the instructions, like a scoop of this into a thing of water and then off you go. Um I started having this stuff after the gym. And for the first week or so, everything was fine, mm-hmm. right? But then after that week, I noticed that I started getting halfway through my workout and I'd hit the wall, uh, zero energy. Yeah. So I went to a different different supplement store. I think it was Reflex mm-hmm. at that time. And I said, I just, I can't get through a workout anymore. I don't understand what's going on. I was like, well, what are you using for supplements? I said, the, this stuff here is like, what flavor is it? I said, mixed berry? He goes, mixed berry? Go grab it. So I went home, grabbed it, brought it back. And it's like this, he goes, that's that's BCAAs. You should be having like protein powder. Oh <laughs> my god! He's good god. I don't know. So that was like big mistake. Oh, right, big mistake. Luckily, I didn't. I didn't get hurt. I didn't ruin yeah. anything. I was just running out of gas. That's and I still. And I I may not work for Supplement King, but I freaking love supplements yeah. and. Uninformed supplement choices are so bad. It's bad. Oh. You can, you can, you could, you could hurt yourself. Like you could absolutely like giving someone pre-workout that has a heart palpitation or something like that. And that's why SK is so on their game about getting people to ask too. Yeah. Um, not only that, but I, I know because I take, I take the supplements that we like that, you, and I know that you can hurt yourself. Like, <laughs> ugh. I'm glad it was only BCAAs though, and not like something like a, a, a ephedrine, because or... oh, ephedrine yeah, was yeah. is still ephedrine HCL is still available for purchase in in yeah. supplement stores. So I'm glad that you, they didn't sell you any of that or no, anything. No, like, no. oh god. I was I was I was as honest as possible with the person behind the counter, saying like, mm-hmm. oh, look, I'm just starting out, right? So I doubt that the person was thinking like, ah, give them the good stuff. I'm like, no. They're but- probably- Protein powder is generally a building block, like yeah. a first to build. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <That's>... So <laughs> it explains why I was just like running out of gas. Yeah. Yeah. Oh so, goodness. What's uh? What can you recall was like your biggest mistake slash realization? Like, oh, I should change this. Um, the fact that I thought I could eat anything I wanted to and drink enough water and work out enough that I would just go away, magically melt away. Mm. So I actually, um, have still have, cause it sticks with you for life, a binge eating disorder. Mm. And I, my trick is I cannot buy the things so I cannot eat them. Right. And it, so I would have people stay over at my house or something like that, or have guests or my stepdad, for example, <clears throat> comes over to my house and brings a shit ton of snacks with him, like enough snacks for a small army and, you know, junk food, you'll buy a cake or a dozen donuts or something or, and so they'll leave and they'll leave it there. And of course, uh, and then I think I can, and then I think I can drink enough water to make it go away yeah. or, or, you know, exercise enough to make it go away. Um, and not not only that, but like not 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 being truthful to myself, hmm. and and pretending to be trying to be um, like someone that I I am not, because for a long time I was really like, oh, I need to be I need to be perfect, like like this Instagram person, fitness person, because it was it was getting a little toxic there for a bit. I was I was seeing too much i was taking too much in and not and not um you know letting it out in a proper in a right, proper right. way um and i was like oh i need to be look perfect like this person or i need to do this exercise to look perfect like this person and well if i can't do this exercise perfectly then i shouldn't bother doing it at all well then i should if i'm not going to do the exercise well then i better not go bother going to the gym and da, 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 da. just an yeah. endless downward spiral and, and then i and then i would you know, and yeah and this was this was before i started um dancing though and Ever since though, like it's just instilled this insane confidence in me and I know my worth mm. and I I had cut people out of my life that weren't 
respecting my time or that were worth my time because you know i'm sure everybody has one person in their life where they're like okay well you could go away and i could never speak to you again and that would be okay energy leech kind of thing you know yeah, right yeah um even people that were forced to be around like coworkers or you know people that we man at the grocery store who's always the guy with the funny eyebrows is always really grumpy <laughs> i'm not gonna say which grocery store he works at <laughs> And it just, you know, my, my mistake was not giving myself, I think my biggest mistake was yeah, not giving myself the credit that I deserved. Yeah. But I learned from it and now I do. <laughs> yes, as you should. But that's that's something that, you know, er, people have to understand on both sides of the fence. Totally. Is that, that is something that cannot be instructed, right? Or instilled in yeah. something that has to be self Earned. absolutely well and, and people are all people ask me too they're like where does your confidence come from and i'm like I, I don't just buy it at walmart it's not it's definitely not something that you can learn i mean of course you can learn from other people but not something that you can can take from other people or like you know purchase it well of course you can purchase it you mean plastic surgery might make you feel more confident which is which is another thing that people ask me about a lot too because they have excess skin and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to get it removed and I'm going to get, you know, things tucked and tightened, but that doesn't mean that I deserve any less, um, than, than the next person who also lost 160 pounds. Um, and, you know, coming to that, that, that realization was a huge part mm. of, of my journey as well is that, you know, I shouldn't be ashamed and pe for example, people to get bariatric surgery should not be ashamed ever, um, of getting that help and people that do shame you shame on them. Mm. That's cause it's not like. It's not cheating. It's not the easy way out. This person has worked, you know, up to this point or in the case of bariatric, like the person is is suffering mm -hmm. and, you know, they deserve to not suffer anymore and they deserve to have, you know, a better body and I deserve to be able to do as I please. And, you know, that's where, you know, a lot of people's confidence can come from. And that's not everybody's case, but that's some people's case. And just being respectful of that mm -hmm. is one of the characteristics that I like to have in my friends, you know, insight um, and being able to see things from other people's perspective. Right. Uh, and that's, you know, and that is that in itself gives me gives me confidence that I know I have insight. Okay. <laughs> that's good. I watch a lot of Dr. Phil and let me tell you, people, not a lot of people have insight. Well, maybe the people on Dr. Phil, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's why they're on Dr. Phil. Maybe. Exactly. <laughs> Did you ever uh were you ever taken back by um, support or pushback by people in your life? Yeah, every everybody, everybody yeah. in my family has something to say about my weight. When I was heavy, and now that I am thinner, Not? yeah, that's right. Yeah. Everyone's everyone's got something to say. Like I went to my aunt's house in Chase, and mm -hmm. she was the aunt I was with when they read my weight out, and she's like, "Well, now you're skinny, too skinny," and I'm like. Thanks. Thanks, Auntie. Yeah, that's 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 great. And then oh. and then I got back to Prince George from that trip and someone called me fat phobic. And I'm like, what? Like, I've I've fat. Phobic. What? <laughs> what? That that's a someone who is fat phobic is someone who is outward projecting a hatred towards fat. Well, my best friend has lipedema. OK, my my boyfriend, you know, he wears a he wears a three X like I love I love like that's that's my my preference like my personal like preference i'm like what like what like how can i i am the farthest thing and it just it enraged me for a moment mm -hmm. and then i clicked on it and it was a troll profile it was like one of those bots or whatever okay, it was yeah, yeah. and i'm like okay so this actually wasn't you know coming from someone i know or it wasn't coming from someone who was like purposely trying to be well obviously they're purposely trying to be hateful um but that's why i keep my page private most and also because they have pictures of my son on there um right. but yeah. uh yeah someone called me fat that really took me back and and i gave it attention for a moment and then i was like you know what sweep it under the rug and and let it be but yeah my every everyone in my family has something to say about um my dancing too because i grew up very uh conservative mennonite uh my grandparents oh. are <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, super, super Mennonite. So they found or they saw, because I try not to post it on Facebook. I posted on Instagram and someone, I think it was my cousin, was in my grandparents' house and they, she was scrolling, he was scrolling through his phone and then it popped up on there. And my grandma's like, is that Lexi? I'm like, 
I kept it hidden for two years though. But okay. and I said, so you know, I called them and I said, because I don't, of all people, to avoid this conversation with, you know, I'm sad that I avoided it with my grandparents for so long. But finally, I called them and I was like, you know what, Grandma? I said, I'm not. I'm not a stripper. I'm not dancing for money. I'm not. And even if I was, you know, I, that's okay too, grandma. Like it's 2022, grandma. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I said, a grandma, I do it for exercise. And it's the best exercise I've had, you know, in my entire life. And my grandma says, well, if that makes you happy, then I'll support you. And I was like, oh, grandma. <laughs> that's the way it should be. Yeah. But I mean, them coming from such a conservative, like they came from Chihuahua, Mexico. So like middle of the desert, nowhere all you had was church and work and home life. Like right. that's on the colony. That's all it is. And on the odd occasion, you go and trade stuff with the local um, native Mexican people and you, they bring it back to the colony and, and like um, pigs and beef and stuff like that, whatever they didn't have on the colony, they didn't grow, they would outsource. And so it was such a different time that they grew up in. And like, I, it's only recently that my grandma started to share things about the, about her home life with me and how on that side too, not only on my paternal side, but my maternal side, you know, there was stories of like, of child abuse and child neglect because it may have been a different time and you know, people may have been- A little high strung. A little, uh, yeah. And, and I feel really grateful as an adult that I get to share, that she shares these stories with me. So it really, and you know, it helps me have, it helps me have um, perspective on other people. Like helps me not be, you know, so wound up and, and be like, hey, well maybe this person comes from the same background that I do. Uh, and so we should all be, we should be nice to everybody. <laughs> and that's that's one of the reasons that I try and be so happy all the time. Cause like, you, you never know if, if someone you know, like, like me, I'm gonna meet someone like me that's had like, to break the cycle of the generational like trauma. Mm. Um, and not even that like my great grandparents were trying to do that. It was just the time that they lived in. And same with my, on my paternal side as well. Um, so being able to recognize enough to break that cycle and to have my grandma approve of something like that, or mm -hmm. have my grandparents not slice my head off when I told them I was pregnant out of wedlock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was huge. Oh, that was the bit, I think, that was probably the hardest people to tell about my pregnancy were my grandparents. Yeah. But they accepted it and they love me and they love my son and it's 2022. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. The world has changed. It you know? so much. And my gra and I'm glad of all people that my, my grandparents, my my loving, loving grandparents are recognizing that. Um and my mom and my all my family around me. Uh, just, you know, the crotchety old ants. <laughs> you know, I have a presence on social media. I don't know if you noticed. Very much. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I have a Patreon. I do my best to try to include the people who support me on Patreon. And I give them an opportunity to ask some questions. Mm -hmm. So there is a couple of questions that people have asked for you. For me? <laughs> yes. Really? Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> They're um, nothing too deep. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. We yeah. can go deep. We don't mind diving deep. So uh, first question is from someone that you know. Oh, really? Uh, Alicia wants to know what oh. type of music you listen to when you get a good workout in. Oh, you know what? I am such a weirdo. My shuffle playlist, it'll be Shania Twain, Tragically Hip, Kids Songs, Death Metal. <laughs> so really anything with a good beat. I Lately, I love incorporating my dance music into my workouts and I'll like dance between my sets. I'll be like, ding, 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 ding. people like looking at me. I'm like, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> it's ex extra circulation. <laughs> that's right. Well, it keeps the synovial fluid moving. That's right. Exactly. I, I really lately have loved, um, what's it called? Uh, Arabian and Indian uh, hip hop and okay. like trance music. I might say this wrong. Sudu Muswala, while it's Sudu, I'm pretty sure that's, um, okay. he, I listen to his music a lot, East Indian hip hop and stuff like that. It has a beat. People are like, my, my friends are like, why do you listen to this? And I'm like, you don't have to know what the words are to enjoy the music. Like it's fantastic. Um, and some, you, you can honestly tell me that you're listening to black metal and metal core and like you understand every lyric there. No, you're that's enjoying well, right? what, Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it doesn't, and, and it doesn't take uh yeah, you don't need to know what the words are saying to feel the beat. Right. And that's, right. that's what, that's what it mainly is. Yeah. yeah. I love something with a good beat. You actually have a, a bit of a background in heavy metal. 
I a little a little tiny just bit. Just a tiny just bit. Just a little tiny bit I've been practicing. <laughs> I got I got I bought myself a nice microphone to practice on and then I got sick for two weeks and I'm like <laughs> oh. so but I've been back on it and I've been practicing and I'm I'm a little I'm okay. Mm. I'm okay. Mm. We're all right. We're practicing. I have a I have a friend that sings and I'm trying to bug him. I'm like, hey, hey, give me some help, friend. Give me some help. <laughs> Teach me. <laughs> Cat wants to know if you still have any of your clothing from when you were your heaviest. I kept one piece. One piece? One piece. The piece that I hated wearing the most because I told myself that I'm never, ever, 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 ever going to fit into it ever again. Right, right, right. <laughs> and it's, um, it's a bathing suit. And I went to the West Edmonton Mall when I was super heavy. And I had to, you know, typical... Forgot the bathing suit, got to go into the store and buy the freaking hundred and fifty dollar because it was plus size swimsuit, and it was so ugly. I cried in the change room. I cried, cried for five minutes, and my uncle's like, "Are you okay? Like, do you want me to come in?" And I'm mm -hmm. like, "No." <laughs> oh, God. Um, <laughs> and I told myself like, I am keeping this to remind myself of what I don't want right. from life, what I need to never ever do again in my life. Right. And I think it's really important that people do that or take measurements and keep your measurements from the very beginning. Mm. It's very, very powerful stuff. That's an awesome question. That's amazing. <laughs> Dan says, what's your favorite treat meal? A Big Mac meal with buffalo sauce and oh. a Diet Coke from, oh, yes. from McDonald's. Yes. So good. Either that or a big honking fat ice cream from Marble Slab. Just like load it up, cheesecake ice cream and chocolate, just stack it on there. And people see me eating this stuff. And like my friends will see me eating this and they're like, how do you eat this? And, and do it. balance, balance. <laughs> once you once you get to a certain point where you have enough muscle, you just you know, and, it's, fuel. And it's fuel, it's fuel, it fuels your body. So that's why you see all these bodybuilders with like eating a giant ass pizza to themselves, like the whole ass pizza. Yeah. Cause they can. Yeah. I actually ate a whole pizza yesterday. <laughs> 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 Not all at one sitting, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's awesome. Mm, Big Mac. <laughs> Question from Tyler. He says, when was the first time you noticed significant change in the mirror? I... I, I, I can relate to this question. Oh, you know, I, I think the mirror has always been a tough one for me because mm. I do have a bit of like body dysmorphia disorder and it is especially prevalent in the mirror. Mm. Um, and so that's a, I'm really glad you asked that question. So I have actually been actively modeling um, in order to see myself from someone else's perspective. So to not directly only rely on my reflection in the mirror um but to see how someone else sees me because the photographers that i've been working with are like like you you're you're, you're beautiful and i'm like excuse me what like <laughs> what excuse me are you <laughs> talking to me like <laughs> this guy here like <laughs> yeah um and it really helped me see myself from that in that objective way but when I really, because I've been doing it for quite a long time, I've been doing it since 75 pounds, mm -hmm. since I lost 75 pounds, and it just helps so much. And that was really when I first started to see the biggest difference was that first 75 pounds that I had lost, 100 pounds that I had lost, mm -hmm. um, because my, oh man, my, I am shocked at how much my skin had pulled back because you've seen my before pictures, like I had, it was, I had quite a hanging belly over, it was like to my thighs and that just with my first hundred pounds because in a perfect world fat will go off in the order that it lasts in the opposite order that it went on yeah. so my fat was all going on my belly because i was you know eating and pregnant um overeating and pregnant right and so it all went off and it came right off right there and as soon as this started to come off um all of the rest of my body started to melt including my boobs <laughs> <laughs> it happens it does oh man and it's and Whatever, that's what push-up bras are for. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I really, really, really started to notice that, like the biggest difference, I think. And mm. having those the photographers in my life helped so, so much. And I really recommend it to everybody. Like I noticed you guys have a photographer that, that you and Alicia like too. And I think that's so important for keeping yourself in, in check as well. Um, and it, 
it can be expensive and pricey and stuff like that. But if you make friends with a photographer, or even if you take pictures of yourself, like take a, get, you know, a Canon, you can take, actually, no, not even Canons anymore. You can take better pictures on iPhones than you can on my T3. Yeah. Oh, yeah, isn't that true? Yeah. So, you know, taking, even just taking pictures of yourself, like photo document, I find it helps so much because in the mirror in the mirror there's room for your eyes to deceive you not everybody will see it this way but there's there's room there's right. it can happen and especially if it's a one-way mirror or two-way mirror <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. scary <laughs> too many horror shows lately um and it especially it helps you see in a way that's not just the mirror and i find that with me personally that helps so freaking much like i actually just worked with a photographer this weekend and I'm now at the lowest I've ever been. And I'm looking at pictures of myself um, in this in this session. And then in my first session, I'm just like, and that side by side is really when I see. And that's why I find, like, that's why people, like, I, I don't know if you've heard of um, John Arpino, J. Arb's journey on Instagram. He's lost like 300 and... Yeah, oh yeah, 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 that, that does ring a bell. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've been friends with him for like over 10 years now. And I was friends with him when he was at his heaviest too. And he said that when it's side by side, that's when you yourself as the person who lost the weight can really see like the huge difference that you've made in your life. And, and for people that have been, you know, large, it's very, it's very hard sometimes to unsee yourself. And that's what the body dysmorphia, you know, does to you. Right. right. Um, and another really great reason to seek out help from your doctor, because, you know, unraveling that ball of twine with someone else talking about it helps a lot, a lot. Massively. That's an awesome question. That's an amazing question. <laughs> I, awesome. I, I'm lucky with the, the ones who uh, pop up with questions and, and support me and everything I do. So. That's so cool. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, is there anything out there on social media that you want to drive people towards to support you? Well, I mean, I've thought about making my Instagram public because, you know, really, it's if something's going to happen, it's going to happen regardless of my, it's just a little bit of my, you know, my anxiety still. So if you want to follow me on Instagram, I miss Paul Nelson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um and uh i post pictures of my son and food and pole and sexy car washes and <laughs> 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 photographs of myself and <laughs> a mixed bag uh, right it's a yeah. whole it's a whole mixed bag of nuts <laughs> uh is there anything else you wanted to uh bring up before we call it a day thank you for oh, for and Thank you, Patreon people, for asking me questions. It's amazing. <laughs> and thank you for hearing me and hearing my story. And I really hope that if someone watches this and they want to start too, that they would, you know, start those, make some, one of those, you know, one of those steps, seeing your doctor or, you know, joining the gym or having that chat with yourself, even just writing something down anything I, I hope that people can find some motivation to better themselves or to make somebody smile or something like that <laughs> make some music make some art something something the whole important part is starting yeah that's that's it and that's that's the most important part um and if you if you mess up there's always tomorrow this is very true mm -hmm. thank you thank you <laughs> this is awesome <laughs>